Welcome to part five of our apologetics Bible study of the book of Galatians. As I've mentioned before, we're approaching this book with an eye for the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. And we've worked our way up to chapter 4, verse 8, which is where we'll pick up today. But let's do a quick recap first. So the book of Galatians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in Galatia to correct the false teachers who were trying to convince them that followers of Jesus should be required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And Paul says, no, that is a false gospel and I'm going to explain to you exactly why. And that's why he wrote this letter. So in chapter 1, Paul admonishes the Galatians to follow no other gospel than the one that Paul preached to them, the gospel of Jesus. And he begins to explain how he was called by God. And in chapter 2, he shows how he was accepted by the other apostles at Jerusalem and how they were all in agreement that Gentiles aren't required to be circumcised or to keep the law of Moses. And then we see him publicly rebuking the apostle Peter for separating from the Gentiles. And Paul then uses that confrontation to launch into a theological masterclass starting in chapter 3, where he contrasts faith and God's promise with works of the law. And then he begins talking about who are the inheritors of God's promise? Who are the, the members of God's family, the children of God? Well, it's those who have placed their faith in Jesus. And that's where we'll pick up today. And we'll try to get through two big sections remaining here in, in chapter 4. Paul first talks about his concern for the Galatians, and then he makes a really interesting and, and in some circles controversial analogy involving Abraham and Sarah and their, and their servant Hagar. And guys, I'm telling you, as we've been making our way through this book, I've become convinced that as Paul was writing this letter to the churches in Galatia, he had a copy of the Torah sitting next to him, and he had it open to the book of Genesis, because he returns time and again to the, to the life and faith of Abraham in his arguments against the Judaizers. And that pattern is going to continue here in chapter 4. When we last left off, Paul was sort of giving us the conclusion to his line of argumentation about how we inherit God's promise to Abraham and become part of his family through faith in Jesus. So let's jump back a couple verses and reread his concluding comments from last time, and then we'll continue on into the next passage. It's a good sized chunk of text, so we'll read it through and then we'll circle back and unpack it. So starting at uh, chapter 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you, and he's speaking to those who have come to faith in Jesus here. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And, a, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Okay, so we really get a sense of Paul's concern for the churches in Galatia here. We're coming out of what I refer to as a master class in biblical theology. And now in this section, we see the more pastoral side of the Apostle Paul. 
And there are some interesting comments in here that have led to some debate among Bible scholars. So let's start back at verse 8 and follow what Paul's saying here. He says, verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? So as we've talked about before, Paul's entire argument so far has been firmly grounded in the Torah because he's addressing the false teachings of the Judaizers who claimed that followers of Jesus should be required to keep the Jewish law. And yet here in verses 8 and 9, we see statements like, when you did not know God, and Paul asks how they can turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world. And these don't seem to be the types of things that Paul would say to his fellow Jews, do they? So some scholars have suggested that maybe this passage, starting at verse 8, is aimed specifically at Gentile believers. But there's another school of thought that I believe more accurately captures the spirit of this letter as a whole. Again, the, the primary goal of the book of Galatians is to refute the false teachings of the Judaizers. And what did they teach? That Christians were required to keep the law of Moses. And we've already seen Paul make several arguments against that idea, right? So that is the target at which Paul's line of argumentation is aimed, right? It's how he began the letter, and it's as, it's as we've seen, his central theme up until now. So Paul's chief concern here is correcting the false teachings of the Judaizers, who say followers of Jesus are required to keep the Mosaic Law, which is the exact same theology known today as Torahism, or Hebrew roots. And Paul calls it a distortion of the gospel of Jesus. So, no matter who Paul is directing his comments to, whether it's Jewish believers or Gentile believers or, or a little of each, we know what his arguments are about, namely the false gospel of the Judaizers. And there's actually some textual evidence that these comments were meant to include Jewish believers as well. For example, the phrase, elementary principles of the world, was used back in verse 3 of this chapter when Paul was still talking about those born under the law, namely the Jewish people, which tells us that Paul wasn't exclusively targeting Gentiles with the use of that phrase. In fact, in our last episode, I suggested that Paul may have chosen that phrase intentionally to speak to both Jews, including the Jewish Judaizers, and Gentiles. And the Greek behind that phrase, which is stuhia o kosmu, allows for both options. The Jewish believer would understand it as a reference to basic religious teachings, the, the ABCs of the Law of Moses. And yet, that same phrase can also refer to spiritual powers, like evil spirits and demonic entities. So the Gentile believers would understand that same phrase as a reference to their former way of life, worshiping idols and false gods and all that. And either way, Paul's pointing this passage, hey, now that you've come to know God through your faith in Jesus, right? Now that you know the truth of the gospel of Jesus, Paul asks, how can you turn back to those former things? And whether it's the ABCs of the law of Moses or, or pagan spiritual powers, Paul calls those former things weak and worthless in light of the power and significance of Jesus. Which is why he says, verse 9, How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? And there's that theme of slavery again. We talked about this in previous episodes. Paul compares the requirements of the law to slavery or imprisonment. Now, this isn't Paul's complete concept of the law, of course. But because he's opposing the Judaizers' misapplication of the Mosaic law, on followers of Jesus, he's highlighting the, the difficult yet very true aspect of the law of Moses as a constraining or restrictive force. And Paul goes on to say, verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So this comment about days and months and seasons is, is pretty interesting because again, it could be applied to Jewish and Gentile believers. And as much as we wish Paul would have provided more detail here, you wonder if he kept this statement intentionally ambiguous for that reason. 
just like he may have done with the elementary principles comment. So Paul could be thinking of the days and months and seasons celebrated in the pagan world, or in light of his ongoing argument against the, the teaching of the Judaizers, he could just as well be referring to the Jewish liturgical calendar with its Sabbaths and new moons and, and annual feasts and so on. And actually, I think the latter option is the better fit contextually. It echoes what Paul teaches in Romans 14, where he speaks equally ambiguously about the notion of days and food. Uh, Romans 14, 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in, the honor of the, in honor of the Lord. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So Paul takes the position here, and in a number of his other writings, that keeping special days or weeks or months hasn't been prohibited or forbidden under Jesus and the new covenant. We're free in Christ to keep them or not keep them. And we shouldn't judge others who choose to do it differently than we do. Okay, so back in Galatians, what have we learned so far about what the Judaizers were teaching? Well, we know from chapter 2 it included circumcision. And we also saw Paul rebuke Peter for not eating together with the Gentiles, which suggests that kosher food was probably part of their false doctrine as well. And from Paul's comments in verse 10 here about days and months and seasons, it's likely that the Judaizers were also teaching observance of the, the Sabbath and the feasts and the other appointed times required in Jewish law. And the fact that the churches in Galatia were starting to believe that they were required to keep those special days caused Paul to wonder if he had labored over them in vain when he had planted those churches and first taught them the gospel. He's wondering if the Galatians might end up rejecting the gospel entirely. So Paul goes on to remind them of their shared history. You can sense his love for the believers in Galatia and his frustration that they're entertaining the Judaizers' false teachings. So he's writing to them as a loving spiritual father. Uh, continuing on, Galatians 4, verse 12. Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. So, so Paul had become like the Gentiles in the sense of not being under the Mosaic law and rejecting the law as a means of righteousness in God's eyes. And he's now challenging the Galatian churches to become like him by also rejecting the legalism that, that they wanted to return to after having already found freedom through faith in Christ. And, and he reminds them of how they met, which, which reveals a little backstory about what brought Paul to Galatia in the first place. Verse 13, you know it was because of a, a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So evidently, Paul's original intention wasn't to preach the gospel in Galatia, but he was sort of forced into it by some sort of bodily ailment. Now, he doesn't tell us what he was struggling with, but the two most popular theories are either that it was malaria or some sort of trouble with his eyesight. And by the way, think about how amazing that is. Some sort of physical problem caused Paul to wander off his intended path and landed him in Galatia. And what does he do while he's being nursed back to health? Well, he preaches the gospel of Jesus and ends up starting a bunch of churches. And in this passage, he's speaking to the hearts of those people in Galatia, many of whom who, that he had met. He's reminding them of his love for them and their love for him. At one point, they were willing to sacrifice anything for Paul. Verse 15, what has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. He's reminding them of the close bond that they, want, that they once had. And he asks in verse 16, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? So it seems that the Judaizers were trying to turn the churches in Galatia against Paul, right? He's asking, what happened to that love? What happened to the joy when you first heard the gospel and you put your trust in Jesus? All right, Paul's bringing their minds back to when they first received the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. In a sense, 
He's reminding them of their first love. And I think we can learn something today from Paul's apologetic approach when speaking to believers who have wandered away from the truth of the gospel, like some of our Hebrew Roots friends have done. Because one of the telltale signs of a false teacher is that they overtly try to convert people into their own doctrine rather than pointing them to the truth and sufficiency of Christ. And we see that insidiously happening in the Hebrew Roots movement today. For example, in many Torah-observant congregations, they'll read from the Torah portion and teach on Moses and Abraham and the law, all of which are valid parts of our faith, of course. But they often do so in place of and to the detriment of the gospel of Jesus. So you'll notice that as people get deeper and deeper into Torahism, their focus begins to shift, sometimes imperceptibly at first, but it invariably moves them away from Jesus and away from grace and faith and toward Moses and works of the law. And as foundational and important as the Torah is to the Christian faith, that's not where life is found. Life is not found in the Torah or the law, but in Jesus who said, uh, John 5 verse 39, you search the scriptures. And remember, when Jesus uses the word scriptures, he's referring to the Hebrew Bible. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So think about how this played out. Paul originally visited Galatia, and he led them to Christ, and he started new churches. And then, sometime later, the Judaizers show up. And just like Hebrew roots evangelists today, they weren't trying to win lost sinners to Jesus. These people already knew Jesus. No, they were trying to lure saved sinners away from the church and away from Jesus. They were poaching converts from the gospel-believing churches that Paul had planted. There's some irony in that. Don't miss that Paul's motivation is to glorify Jesus. As he'll write in chapter 6, he'll say, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by contrast, the Judaizers were apparently glorifying themselves and boasting in their converts because Paul writes in, in verse 17, They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you, make, that you may make much of them. Now, I don't use the, uh, the Message Bible too often, but I like how it renders this verse. It says, They want to shut you out of the free world of God's grace so that you will always depend on them for approval and direction, making them feel important. A godly teacher doesn't use people or lay unnecessary burdens on them, right? No, they help people to grow in the knowledge and freedom and love of Jesus, whose yoke is easy and his burden is light. All glory belongs to Jesus Christ, whose name is above every other name. Even Moses and the prophets agree with that. So beware of any religious teacher who implies that, that the keeping of the Mosaic rituals, like a kosher food diet, or the Torah feasts, or, or the weekly Shabbat, or, or circumcision, will somehow add any amount of righteousness to what Jesus has already done for you. Or that keeping those things somehow makes you more holy, or, or is how you show your love for God today, or, or, or elevates you in God's eyes or that not doing those things is sinful. Those are all lies that undermine the sufficiency of Christ. And you'll notice that the fruits of those teachings, the, the outworkings of Hebrew roots theology, it often consists of shame and confusion and condemnation and division in the body of Christ. I mean, if you think I'm exaggerating, just read through the comments on any of our videos. Okay, so Paul goes on, verse 18. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So he refers to the Galatians as his children. It's a term of affection, and he talks about how he is again in the anguish of childbirth, which means he probably had some struggles when he first stood up those churches in Galatia and, and taught the new believers, right? And now he calls them his little children. He uses that same term for the church in Corinth and for Timothy and Titus. This is the concern of a pastor 
praying for growth in his young flock. And he says in verse 20, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. So it's Paul's love for the believers in Galatia that's driving him to take such a strong tone with them in this letter and to tell them the hard truth. As he explained in the first part of chapter 4, they had become sons and daughters of God and heirs through faith in Christ. But the Judaizers were trying to, were trying to turn them back into beggars and slaves. I like how Warren Wearsby describes the situation. He says, They have not lost the experience of salvation. They were still Christians, but they were losing the enjoyment of their salvation and finding satisfaction in their works instead. Sad to say, they did not realize their losses. They actually thought they were becoming better Christians by substituting law for grace and the religious deeds of the flesh for the fruit of the Spirit. And again, the parallels between the Judaizers and modern-day Torahism are uncanny. And with that, Paul's now going to move from the concerned pastor to the stern spiritual teacher rebuking his beloved students. In the final passage in chapter 4, Paul returns to the Torah and once again draws from the story of Abraham. And these kinds of passages really give you a sense of Paul as a student of Scripture who studied at the feet of the legendary rabbi Gamaliel. And as Jesus so often did, Paul begins with the ancient Jewish signal of a citation, for it is written. Right? But, but the way Paul is going to use the law here was likely a surprise to, the, to his readers and to modern-day Hebrew roots teachers as well. Because just like he did in chapter 3, although he's quoting from the Torah, he's appealing to Abraham, not Moses. And remember that the Hebrew word Torah means instruction or teaching. So the redemptive history that, that we find in Genesis and, and the story of Abraham is every bit as much Torah as the legal commands given at Sinai. And one more quick note here. So in some circles, the allegory Paul is about to use is considered highly inappropriate, if not a misuse of scripture. And I think it's a fair question to ask how Paul could have felt comfortable taking such license with an Old Testament passage and using it to teach something that the original human author almost certainly did not intend. And what's interesting is that this is actually a very Jewish method of exegesis or interpreting scripture. The rabbis and sages would often use approaches like allegory or pesher or midrash, but at the same time, it's a uniquely Christian approach because Paul and the other New Testament authors used as their starting point for interpreting the Hebrew Bible, events which for, which for them at the time were outside of scripture. There was no New Testament yet. They were living and writing the New Testament at that time. So when they approached the only scripture they have, the, the, what we call the Old Testament, they interpreted it in light of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Paul and the New Testament authors were witnesses to what scholars call the Christ event. And so for them, that was the fundamental reality through which they now viewed the Hebrew scriptures. So remember, Jesus opened their minds to what the law and the prophets foretold about him. So their experiential knowledge of Jesus as the promised Messiah and as God incarnate, that was their hermeneutical priority. As scholar Keith Stanglin describes it, with Jesus' help, early Christian hindsight became 2020. Thus, the experience of the Christ event was sufficient to leave the early church to see their Jewish scriptures in a whole new light. So with that, let's read through this final passage of this chapter in Paul's provocative allegory, and then we'll go back and unpack it. And bear with me as I read this because this is a big passage and there's a lot of stuff packed in there. But don't worry, we'll go back and look at it all. So, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, 
for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit what the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Who? Okay, this is a densely packed passage full of amazing insights. So what Paul's doing here, and he states it outright, is creating an allegory, which is just when you use characters or images symbolically to explain an abstract principle, right? So it's using symbolism to teach a real truth. And in this case, of course, Paul's using characters and events from the book of Genesis. Now, you're probably familiar with the story, but just to make sure we all understand the allegory, let's take a real quick sidebar and remind ourselves of the, event that, of the events that Paul's referencing. And, and by the way, if you've ever been tempted to think that the Bible is boring, check out this Jerry Springer episode. In fact, let's head over to the chalkboard so we can keep it all straight. Okay, so Abraham was called by God who promised him many descendants, right? And, and we read about that in Genesis 12, where God tells Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, and, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But Abraham's wife, Sarah, wasn't able to have children. And eventually, Sarah became impatient, and as we read about in Genesis 16, she gave Abraham her Egyptian servant, Hagar, as a wife and told them to have a baby. And while this was an acceptable act in that society, particularly because the, the continuation of family lines was so important to them, it certainly wasn't the will of God. So sure enough, Hagar gets pregnant and Sarah gets jealous and starts treating Hagar so harshly that a pregnant Hagar runs away. Now, God steps in and sends her back, and he tells her he will take care of her and the baby. And this is all from Genesis 16. So Hagar returns and has a son whom she names Ishmael. And then, years later, and we see this in Genesis 17, God comes to Abraham and promises him that he will have a son by Sarah. And then in Genesis 18, God reaffirms the promise to Sarah as well. And Sarah, who was 89 years old at the time, laughed at the idea. So God told them to name their son Isaac, or in Hebrew, Yitzhak, which means he laughs or one who laughs. So finally, when Sarah is 90 years old and, and Abraham's 100, their son Isaac is born. Isaac down here. As we see in Genesis 21, but this creates a new problem in the home because Ishmael had been Abraham's only son for 14 years. And now there's, now there's this new kid, right? And sure enough, Ishmael starts to mock Isaac and, and cause trouble in, in the home. So Sarah, once again, tells Abraham to kick Hagar and Ishmael out of the home, which, which broke Abraham's heart. But God tells him here in Genesis 21, starting at verse 12, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named, and I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. Okay, so Abraham packs up a bunch of provision and sends them away. And as they're wandering in the wilderness, God, God comes to them and, and takes care of them. So... With that drama in mind, let's now return to Galatians 4 and take a look at what Paul's trying to tell us in his allegory. So, verse 21, Paul says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? So he's saying that the Galatians, who want to follow the teachings of the Judaizers and put themselves under the law, 
are rejecting God's gift and completely missing the purpose of the law. Do you not listen to the law? And then he begins to talk about this whole situation with Abraham. Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Okay, so he's referring to Hagar, Sarah's servant, who he calls a slave woman. And she bore Ishmael. And then Sarah, who Paul refers to as a free woman, who bore Isaac, right? So Hagar was a servant, while Sarah was the freely chosen wife of Abraham. And these are the historical figures that Paul's going to use in his allegory. And he goes on to say in verse 23, But the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So Ishmael was born according to the flesh, meaning he was born out of Sarah and Abraham taking matters into their own hands and choosing under their own fleshly power to assure that Abraham had a descendant, even though God had previously promised Abraham that he would give him descendants. But rather than trusting God's promise, they resorted to works of the flesh. And in contrast to that, Isaac was born of Sarah just as God had promised. So Ishmael was born according to the flesh, while Isaac was born according to the promise. And some of the ideas we're seeing here in this illustration might remind you of, of the illustration we made in our last episode, where Paul is contrasting these same concepts. On the one hand, there is flesh and works and slavery. And on the other hand, there is faith and promise and freedom. And like a master teacher or a rabbi, Paul uses repetition in this letter to make sure his teachings being understood. Because in this allegory, He's just reiterating the concepts that he's already covered in chapter 3 and the first half of, half of chapter 4, but now he's presenting it from a different perspective. So, verse 24, Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Wow. Okay. So, Paul clearly states that he's, that he's using the allegory to talk about what? Two covenants, right? So Paul's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant that Jesus brought us. And Paul is invoking Hagar as a symbol of Mount Sinai, which he says is bearing children for slavery. So what is the significance of Mount Sinai in Scripture? Well, that's where God appeared to the nation of Israel and gave them his law through Moses, right? It's where the law of Moses was given to Israel to serve as the terms of the Sinai covenant. And in Paul's allegory, just like the slave woman gave birth to the son of flesh, Mount Sinai is, in Paul's words here in verse 24, bearing children for slavery. So in what would have been offensive to the Judaizers and maybe a big surprise to the Galatians and what should be a wake-up call to our Hebrew roots friends today, Paul puts Mount Sinai and the law of Moses and the old covenant over here along with flesh and works and slavery. The law of Moses is bearing children for slavery. Verse 25, now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Well, okay, so Hagar corresponds to the, we'll call it the PJ, present Jerusalem. And at the time Paul wrote this letter, what did the city of Jerusalem represent? Well, it was the active epicenter of the Jewish faith, right? This is where the temple stood. The, the synagogues throughout the world at that time were built so that they faced toward Jerusalem. And at the time Paul wrote this letter, the Levitical priesthood was still intact and the temple was fully operational. Remember when Jesus was talking with the Samaritan woman at the well? Let's flip over to John 4, verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. 
So Jerusalem was the center of worship for the Jewish people. In fact, the Torah requires a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times every year for the feasts. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So Jesus foretold that Jerusalem and the temple would cease to be the center of the worship of God. Under the new covenant, the proper worship of God isn't restricted to a geographic location. It happens in spirit and in truth. And what Jesus prophesied came to pass. So, back in Galatians 4, verse 25, Paul writes, And this is after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and therefore under the new covenant. Paul says, Hagar corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. So just as Hagar was a slave and gave birth to a child who was a slave, and at that time children born to slaves were also slaves, unless the, the master adopted them. And Paul says that the present Jerusalem, the epicenter of the Jewish faith, is now in slavery with her children, meaning those Jewish people who refused the gift of grace that God, got, that God offered them through Jesus and were still under the, the slavery of the law. And by contrast, Paul says, verse 26, But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. And then he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So that's a quote from Isaiah 54.1. So what's Paul getting at here? Well, in this text, Isaiah is metaphorically portraying Jerusalem as an abandoned, deserted city. And Isaiah personifies Jerusalem, or Zion as he calls it, as a woman describing herself as being barren and bereaved of children. We see that in Isaiah 49. So the idea Paul is picking up on in this text is that God can bring abundant blessing where, humanly speaking, it seems impossible. It's the same principle behind Isaac being miraculously born to 90-year-old Sarah who was barren. And Paul's connecting that same idea to Gentile believers who miraculously become heirs of God's promise to Abraham through faith. So this is one of those amazing connections to the Old Testament that the original Jewish readers would have picked up on, but, but we often miss today. So, more directly, Paul is contrasting the present Jerusalem that is in slavery with the Jerusalem above, and I'll put a J and an arrow, that is free. So what does he mean by the Jerusalem above? Well, this is a way to contrast the old Jerusalem with what the book of Revelation calls the new Jerusalem. It's the Messianic kingdom. And as Bible scholar Alan Cole explains, the concept of a new Jerusalem is very familiar from the Old Testament. In view of passages like Ezekiel 48 and Isaiah 62, it was easy to speak of an ideal Jerusalem already existing in heaven in the mind and purpose of God and one day destined to be established on earth by the act of God. To Paul, the present Jerusalem is not only the familiar city of his boyhood, with the temple at its heart, but also the whole race of Israel. Again, this was a familiar usage from the Old Testament where Jerusalem can stand for its inhabitants or even for the whole nation. So when Paul contrasts the present Jerusalem with the Jerusalem above, He's comparing the old and new Jerusalems, and in this allegory, the city on earth below, the present Jerusalem, is a symbol of the old Mosaic Covenant. And the Jerusalem in heaven above represents the new covenant. So why does he refer to Jerusalem above, the new covenant, as our mother? Well, what do mothers do? Well, among other things, they give life, right? And Paul told us in the last chapter, in chapter 3, verse 21, that the law cannot give life. Rather, Paul says, life comes through faith in Jesus. So in Paul's allegory, life comes through Sarah, who represents 
the new covenant and freedom and promise and faith, right? But the Judaizers were trying to make Hagar their mother, their source of life. And by doing so, they, they were enslaving people just like Torahism does today. And Warren Wearsby points out some really interesting parables in this allegory. For example, think about this. Hagar was not Abraham's first wife. Sarah was his first wife, right? And likewise, in God's kingdom, grace and promise come before the law. And we see this going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God showed grace at the first sin, and he gave a promise in Genesis 3.15 that Jesus would one day come to set things right. And we see it in God's covenant to Abraham, too, which was a covenant of grace, right, in which God required nothing but only made a promise to Abraham. We also see it in, in the story of Israel when God rescued them by his grace out of Egypt before he gave them the law. And in our last episode, we saw how Paul had said that back in chapter 3, verse 19, how the law was added, just like Hagar was added to, a to Abraham as his second wife. And we also saw in chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, that the law was given temporarily to perform a specific function, to act as our guardian or tutor, and then it was no longer needed. And Hagar also performed a function temporarily and then was then sent away. And remember that Abraham's marriage to Hagar was not God's will. It was the byproduct of unbelief and a work of the flesh. It's the oldest story in the book. Abraham and Sarah didn't trust God's promise to give them children, and instead they went their own way. They enlisted Hagar to do what only Sarah could do, and it failed. As Paul's been teaching for the last two chapters, the, the law cannot give life or righteousness or a spiritual inheritance. And then Paul goes on to summarize his allegory, verse 28. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so just as Ishmael persecuted Isaac, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So followers of Jesus are children of promise. Just like chapter 3, verse 29 says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And just like Ishmael persecuted Isaac, the Judaizers were oppressing the churches in Galatia. And I would add, just like many in Torahism today are persecuting believers who don't eat kosher or keep the feasts or, or keep the weekly uh, Mosaic Shabbat. But Paul says in verse 30, what does Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. So just like God cast out Hagar, Paul is telling the, the churches in Galatia to cast out the Judaizers. Why? Because believers in Jesus are not children of the slave woman. We aren't in slavery to the law. We're children of the free woman, Abraham's heirs through faith in Jesus. And that brings us to the end of chapter 4, at least according to our modern chapter numbering, right? But an argument could be made that Paul's thought is actually concluded in the next verse, which would be Galatians 5.1, which says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, I showed you freedom in Christ, so do not submit again to the, to the slavery of the law. And what's amazing to me about Paul's entire argument here is that he is using the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, the same scriptures that the Judaizers were using to try and impose the law on the Galatians, Paul is using to disprove and discredit the Judaizers. Amazing. Okay, so let's wrap up here for today. In our next episode, we're going to pick up with Paul's statement about the freedom that is ours in Christ. And he's going to unpack that for us and move into the application of what all this means to our lives. How do we live out our lives as heirs of the promise and children of the free woman? Now, our Hebrew roots friends commonly challenge that, hey, if the, if the law isn't in effect, does that mean we're free to do whatever we want? We can commit adultery and, and steal and kill? Which, of course, is completely silly. And in chapter 5, Paul's going to tell us exactly why that is not the case. <laughs>
Thank you for watching. Shalom.